Good morning, boys and girls. Today, I'm going to share again A Long Walk to Water by Linda Supark. And today we're going to look at chapters 8 and 9. They're very short. Um, and what I want you to consider is, how does Salva find the strength to go on? He's in a very difficult situation, and um, so is Naya, for that matter. And I want you to think about what is supporting Salva right now. All right, chapter eight, Southern Sudan, 2008. It was like music, the sound of Akir's laugh. Naya's father had decided that Akir needed a doctor. So Naya and her mother had taken Akir to the special place, a big white tent full of people who were sick or hurt with doctors and nurses to help them. After just two doses of medicine, Akir was nearly her old self again. Still thin and weak, but able to laugh as Naya sat on the floor next to her uh, uh, next to her cot and played a clapping game with her. The nurse, a white woman, was talking to Naya's mother. Her sickness came from the water. The nurse explained, she should drink only good clean water. If her, the water is dirty, you should boil it for a count of 200 before she drinks it. Naya's mother nodded that she understood, but Naya could see the worry in her eyes. The water from the hole in the lake bed could be collected only in tiny amounts. If her mother tried to boil such a small amount, the pot would be dry long before they could count to 200. It was a good thing then that they would soon be returning to the village. The water that Naya fetched from the pond in the plastic jug could be boiled before they drank it. But what about next year at camp and the year after that? And even at home, whenever Naya made the long, hot walk to the pond, she had to drink as soon as she got there. She would never be able to stop Akir from doing the same. Wow. A lot to think about. Southern Sudan, 1985. The lake surface was calm, and once the boats had pulled away from the shore, there was not much to see, just water and more water. They paddled for hours. The scenery and motion were so monotonous that Salva might have slept, except he was afraid that if he did, he might fall over the side. He kept himself awake by counting the strokes of Uncle's paddle and trying to gauge how far the canoe traveled with every 20 strokes. Finally, the boat pulled up to an island in the middle of the river. This was where the fishermen of the Nile lived and worked. Salva was amazed by what he saw in the fishing community. It was the first place in their weeks of walking that had an abundance of food. The villagers ate a lot of fish, of course, and hippo and crocodile meat as well. But even more impressive were the number of crops they grew, cassava, sugarcane, yam, yams. It was easy to grow food when there was a whole river to water the crops. None of the travelers had money or anything of value to trade, so they had to beg for food. The exception was uncle. The fisherman gave him food without having to be asked. Salva could not tell if this was because uncle seemed to be the leader of the group or because they were afraid of his gun. Uncle shared his food with Salva, a piece of sugar cane to suck on right away, then fish that they cooked over a fire and yams roasted in the ashes. The sugar cane juice soothed the sharpest edge of Salva's hunger. He was able to eat the rest of the meal slowly, making each bite last a long time. At home, Salva had never been hungry. His family owned many cattle. They were among the better off families in their village of Luarik. They ate mostly porridge made from shore gum and milk. Every so often, his father went to the marketplace by bicycle and brought home bags of beans and rice. They, these had been grown elsewhere because few crops could be raised in the dry, semi-desert region of Luarik. As a special treat, his father sometimes brought mangoes. A bag of mangoes was awkward to carry, especially when the bicycle was already loaded with other goods, so he wedged the mangoes into the spokes of his bicycle wheels. When Salva ran to greet him, he could see the, the green-skinned mango spinning gaily in a blur as his father pedaled. That's kind of clever to put him in the spokes. 
Salva would take a mango from the spokes almost before his father had dismounted. His mother would peel it for him, its juicy insides the same color as her headscarf. She would slice the flesh away from the big, flat seed. Salva loved the sweet juice slices, but his favorite part was the seed. There was plen always plenty of fruit that clung stubbornly to the seed. He would nibble and suck at it to get every last shred, making it last for hours. There were no mangoes among the fishermen's great stores, but sucking on his piece of sugar cane reminded Salva of those happier times. He wondered if he would ever again see his father riding a bicycle with mangoes in its spokes. As the sun touched the horizon, the fishermen abruptly went into their tents. They weren't really tents, just white mosquito netting hung or draped to make a space so they could lie down inside. Not one fisherman stayed to talk or eat more or do anything else. It was almost as if they all vanished at the same moment. Only a few minutes later, mosquitoes rose up from the water, from the reeds, from everywhere. Huge dark clouds of them appeared, their high-pitched white line filling the air. Thousands, maybe millions of hungry mosquitoes massed so thickly that in one breath, Salva could have ended up with a mouthful if he wasn't careful. And even if he was, they were everywhere in his eyes, nose, ears, on every part of his body. The fishermen stayed in their nets the whole night long. They had even dug channels from inside the nets to just beyond them so they could urinate without having to leave their tents. Ew. It didn't matter how often Sava swatted at the mosquitoes or that one swat killed dozens at a time. For every one he killed, it seemed that hundreds more swarmed in to take its place. With their high singing whine constantly in his ears, Salva slapped and waved at them in frustration all night long. No one in the group got any sleep. The mosquitoes made sure of that. In the morning, Salva was covered with bites. The worst ones were in the exact middle of his back, where he couldn't reach or scratch. Those he could reach, though, he scratched until they bled. The travelers got into the boats one more time to paddle from the island to the other side of the Nile. The fishermen had warned the group to take plenty of water for the next stretch of their journey. Salva still had the gourd that the old woman had given him. Others in the group had gourds too, or plastic bottles, but there were some who did not have a container. They tore strips of their clothing and soaked them in a desperate attempt to carry at least a little water with them. Again, Ahead lay the most difficult part of their journey, the Akobo Desert. Chapter 9, Southern Sudan, 2008. Naya's family had been back in the village for several months the day the visitors came. In fact, it was nearly time to leave for the camp again. As the jeep drove up, most of the children ran to meet it. Shy about meeting strangers, Naya hung back. Two men emerged from the jeep. They spoke to the biggest boys, including Naya's brother, Deep, who led them to the home of the village's chief, his and Naya's uncle. The chief came out of his house to greet the visitors. They sat in the shade of the house with some of the other village men and drank tea together and talked for a while. What are they talking about? Naya asked Deep. Something about water, Deep replied. Water? The nearest water was the pond, of course, half a morning's walk away. Anyone could have told them that. Southern Sudan, 1985. Salva had never seen anything like the desert. Around his village, Luerik, enough grass and shrubs grew to feed the grazing cattle. There were even trees. But here, in the desert, nothing green could survive except tiny evergreen Acadia bushes which somehow endured the long winter months with almost no water. Uncle said it would take three days to cross the Akobo. Salva's shoes stood no chance against the hot stony desert ground. The soles, made from rubber tire treads, had already been reduced to shreds held together with a little leather and a great deal of hope. 
After only a few minutes, Salva had to kick off the flapping shreds and continue barefoot. The first day in the desert felt like the longest day Salva had ever lived through. The sun was relentless and eternal. There was neither wisp of cloud nor whiff of breeze for relief. Each minute of walking in that arid heat felt like an hour. Even breathing became an effort. Every breath Salva took seemed to drain strength rather than restore it. Thorns gored his feet. His lips became cracked and parched. Uncle cautioned him to make the water in his gourd last as long as possible. It was the hardest thing Salva had ever done, taking only tiny sips when his body cried out for huge gulps of thirst-quenching, life-giving water. The worst moment of the day happened near the end. Salva stubbed his bare toe on a rock, and his whole toenail came off. The pain was terrible. Salva tried to bite his lip, but the awfulness of that never-ending day was too much for him. He lowered his head, and the tears began to flow. Soon he was crying so hard that he could hardly get his breath. He could not think. He could barely see. He had to slow down. And for the first time on the long journey, he began to lag behind the group. Stumbling about blindly, he did not notice the group drawing farther and farther ahead of him. As if by magic, Uncle was suddenly at his side. Salva Mawindua Arik, he said, using Salva's full name loud and clear. Salva lifted his head, the sobs interrupted by surprise. Do you see that group of bushes? Uncle said, pointing. You need only to walk as far as those bushes. Can you do that, Salva Mawindu at Arik? Salva wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. He could see the bushes, and they did not look too far away. Uncle reached into his bag. He took out a tamarind and handed it to Salva. Chewing on the sour, juicy fruit made Salva feel a little better. When they reached the bushes, Uncle pointed out a clump of rocks up ahead and told Salva to walk as far as the rocks. After that, alone Acadia, another clump of rocks, a spot bare of everything except sand. Uncle continued in this way for the rest of the walk. Each time he spoke to Salva using his full name. Each time Salva would think of his family and his village, and he was somehow able to keep his wounded feet moving forward one painful step at a time. At last, the sun was reluctantly forced from the sky. A blessing of darkness fell across the desert, and it was time to rest. The next day was a precise copy of the one before, the sun and the heat, and worst of all to Salva's mind, a landscape that was utterly unchanged. The same rocks, the same Acadias, the same dust, there was not a thing to indicate that the group was making any progress at all across the desert. Salva felt as if he had walked for hours while staying in exactly the same place. The fierce heat sent up shimmering waves that made everything look wobbly. Or was he the one who was wobbling? The large clump of rocks up ahead, it almost seemed to be moving. It was moving. It was not rocks at all. It was people. Salva's group drew near. Salva counted nine men. All of them collapsed on the sand. One made a small, desperate motion with his hand. Another tried to raise his head but fell back again. None of them made a sound. As Salva watched, he realized that five of the men were completely motionless. One of the women in Salva's group pushed forward and knelt down. She opened her container of water. What are you doing? A man called. You cannot save them. The woman did not answer. She, when she looked up, Salva could see tears in her eyes. She shook her head, then poured a little water onto a cloth and began to wet the lips of one of the men on the sand. Salva looked at the hollow eyes and the cracked lips of the men lying on the hot sand and his own mouth felt so dry that he nearly choked when he tried to swallow. If you give them your water, you will not have enough for yourself, the same voice shouted. It is useless. They will die, and you will die with them. So just consider the challenges of this group and Salva's. 
How does Sapa find the strength to go on? Right? This isn't a movie. So think about that. Could you do it? All right. I look forward to your thoughts. Bye.